Um, wonderful. So uh, I don't have any uh, any disclosures um, for this slide. Um, uh, as uh, um, John Arthur said, I'm a psychiatrist and a neuroscientist um, working at the Laureate Institute for Brain Research. Um, this is our institute. We're located uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, and uh, if you're ever interested in visiting, uh, please uh, reach out to me. We have uh, postdoctoral scholar uh, opportunities as well. So uh, I wanted to talk to you um, uh, in relation to my motivation and long-term goals as a psychiatrist and a neuroscientist. Um, the things that I think about that kind of motivate me um, are three things. Uh, one is uh, an interest in discovering modifiable neuroscience-based treatment targets um, that are directly linked to pathophysiological abnormalities in psychiatric disorders, not simply just a symptom-based uh, explanation. Um, I want to develop novel tests to identify treatment targets in individual patients um, and to have a clinical impact uh, design novel neuroscience-based therapies that effectively modify these treatment targets um, and ultimately reduce symptom expression and other signs of illness. So today what I'm going to talk with you about are some uh, results that relate to the first um, and the third uh, goals. And most of my research um, is currently focused on interoception, which uh, is the focus of this conference, so it's, it's uh, very uh, convenient. Um, <clears throat> if I were in the audience uh, in the same building as everybody, I would ask you uh, to sort of raise your hands or rate sort of how well you understand the concept of interoception. Uh, but at this point, I'll just wait for you to um, kind of reflect on this question for yourself and we'll return to it at the end of the talk. By way of a, of a definition, uh, here is one definition that um, interoception refers to the process by which the nervous system senses, uh, interprets, and integrates signals originating from within the body, providing a moment-by-moment -moment mapping of the body's internal landscape across conscious and unconscious levels. Uh, so there's, there are a number of um, things that I'd like to point out here. One is um, it, we're talking about the nervous system, so the brain and spinal cord and the peripheral nervous system. Um, as well as this uh, mapping across conscious and unconscious levels. When you look in the interoceptive literature, you'll see a lot of focus on, um, on understanding the conscious elements of interoception, um, maybe uh, not as much directly referring to the unconscious um, phase. Um, this definition uh, is not my own. Uh, this uh, came about as a result of a, um, a consensus uh, that emerged following a, a meeting that we organized at the Laureate Institute in 2016 called the Interoception Summit. If you're interested in reading more, there's a special issue here focused on interoception and mental health. Um, and what I like uh, about um, uh, this image um, is that it sort of illustrates um, the connection between brain and body um, uh, in relation to action. So some of you uh, may or may not know that snipers um, and archers um, are often trained to modulate their breathing, um, in fact, to slow it um, and to release the arrow or pull the trigger um, in between heartbeats, um, because even the, the tiniest vibration of the heartbeat um, uh, when you're aiming at a, at a mark several hundred meters away um, could mean the difference between a bullseye and a complete miss. If you're a sniper, it could be success of your mission or complete failure. Uh, so uh, interoception is not simply just um, how um, we perceive our bodies um, or how the nervous system maps the body, but really it's important for action. This is a timeline uh, covering uh, the English language uh, papers that reference the term interoception. And although Sherrington uh, coined the term in 1906, um, you can see prominent uh, examples uh, of reference to interoceptive um, concepts going back to Darwin, who emphasized the role of palpitations and dyspnea in the experience of emotion, to Bernard James's uh, definition of the milieu interior, um, of course, uh, Pavlov uh, demonstrated classical conditioning um, in visceral organs. Um, so you might argue that he was the originator uh, of interoceptive research. Um, what you can see is over the past century, there's been uh, relatively little um, uh, interest in interoception research, maybe a fluctuation in the, in the 50s and 60s. Um, there are a lot of uh, uh, Eastern European um, investigators uh, studying conditioning of various reflexes. There was a gradual uh, interest uh, 
um, in the 80s, um, around the time of the emergence of the biological psychiatry movement. Um, but it really wasn't until uh, the early 2000s that interest um, has exploded. Um, and you can see that it's, it's really uh, continued and, uh, and we'll be updating this in the future. If you look at the recent articles published on interoception, um, you can see that it is an incredibly interdisciplinary field. So this is just um, articles in the past three years um, that reference uh, the term directly. And you can see that most prominently, uh, the neurosciences and psychiatry and psychology um, are the fields that have, have paid attention to this topic. But if you look, uh, you can see that um, you have philosophy, um, you have a lot of medical subspecialties, neuroimaging, uh, neurology, so uh, it really is a, a broad ranging uh, concept, uh, which in some ways I think makes it uh, difficult uh, to wrap your mind around. Um, however, uh, if you look a little bit more carefully, and this is a review we did a number of years ago, uh, where we looked at all of the um, articles published that reference interoception directly in these blue dots, this is now a logarithmic scale, or if you look at the actual systems uh, themselves uh, that uh, in other words, the underlying uh, uh, physiological systems and features, what you can see is that um, there's almost an order of magnitude more research um, that has gone on um, to understand this process um, without any reference whatsoever um, to the concept. Uh, and most of those studies um, have been in the animal uh, and physiological realm. Uh, and, um, and I think that uh, over time, uh, what we're gonna start seeing is, is a bit more of a convergence across these fields. One of the challenges for the brain is um, in understanding uh, what's really going on inside the body. So this, um, uh, these are some typical interoceptive uh, signals. Um, everything can, is kind of jumbled up, but you can imagine that um, when something particularly relevant like chest pain happens or hunger, or you have a feeling of emptiness in your stomach uh, or kidney stone pain, um, you can imagine how important it is for your nervous system to be able to rapidly single out um, uh, that signal um, and attend to it uh, uh, and to correct sort of the homeostatic uh, disturbance. Um, so when we look at uh, physiological processes that are often ascribed to interoception, um, what you can see is that there are many, many more um, signals um, with dedicated neural pathways uh, than the traditional uh, sort of extraoceptive senses of, of uh, sight and sound and um, smell, taste, and touch. Um, Importantly, there, you can group these across um, painful and non-painful conditions. Uh, and of course, uh, most of the time, uh, we're not aware of, of uh, most of these signals. Um, it's only in, uh, when uh, there's a deviation from homeostasis um, that it becomes relevant for us to interpret them. So uh, what I'd like to um, impart uh, in, is that uh, interoception uh, in this context um, is a neural process, um, and it's one uh, that uh, traverses sensors. So uh, examples uh, of interoceptive sensors include mechanoreceptors, thermoreceptors, chemoreceptors, osmoreceptors, humoral receptors, uh, glucoreceptors, and even free nerve endings that are located throughout the body um, that are connected to pathways. So you have uh, vagal pathways, cranial pathways, pelvic pathways, sacral, spinothalamic, and even somatosensory pathways, um, which relay information to networks. Um, so networks are just uh, groupings of interconnected nerve cells. So we have uh, networks such as the central and peripheral autonomic networks, enteric networks, thalamocortical networks, uh, hypothalamic, limbic, sensory motor, salience, and default uh, mode networks. Um, and these networks um, are critical for circuits. And circuits uh, really um, are, are simply networks that are involved um, directly uh, and engaged in a function. So you have appetitive circuits, affective circuits, arousal circuits, thermal nociceptive circuits, cognitive, social, and threat-based circuits. Um, and interoception spans uh, all of these processes, um, but includes, importantly, this concept of awareness. And awareness can be decomposed uh, uh, in a reductionistic way into um, uh, component processes like detection, attention, uh, insight, um, magnitude or magnitude estimations, um, discrimination, uh, accuracy, 
sensitivity is probably the most common uh, term that you'll see in the human interoception literature, so uh, interoceptive accuracy. Um, and uh, what's important is that uh, these um, processes are holistically integrated, but importantly, they relate primarily to the sense of the internal state of the body. So um, these circuits uh, don't deal with the um, state of uh, another person's body uh, or another animal's body um, or uh, uh, inanimate objects. So it's incredibly uh, uh, self-related. Here's an example of uh, some of the major brain regions involved in interoceptive processing. And I won't go through all of them individually. This paper will be forthcoming. Uh, but what you can see is that there's an incredible array uh, of brain regions uh, beyond what you might have heard, uh, which is sort of most traditionally singled out as the insular cortex. Um, and these brain regions span both cortical, subcortical, and brainstem uh, nuclei or regions. Um, and uh, they share uh, a, a, a quite a close homology uh, across animal systems, particularly mammalian systems, Although I would argue there's evidence um, even for interoceptive processing um, in invertebrates uh, such as octopus uh, and other animals. The other thing uh, that I think is important is that um, interoception classically has referred to this ascending uh, limb uh, of, uh, of brain body um, interactions, uh, but there is an increasing um, perspective um, that interoception also um, includes a regulatory component um, in which the information that is uh, sensed uh, interpreted and integrated um, is, uh, is then um, translated directly into regulatory uh, processing um, uh, in the form of actions, um, in some cases predictions. Um, and you've heard uh, quite a bit about um, the active inference framework um, uh, from Maxwell earlier, so uh, which has really nicely set up uh, this talk. Uh, one, what this means though is that um, you can think of interoception as forming the basis um, for regulation of internal body signals, um, and that there is this sort of closed uh, brain body feedback loop um, that's constantly um, uh, in progress. Now, this is relevant, I think, for uh, neurofeedback researchers. So here's a, a, a paper um, uh, that I think many in the audience will recognize, uh, sort of outlining um, a, a framework for understanding uh, neurofeedback. Of course, um, I don't have to uh, explain this in detail. What I would like to emphasize is this other modalities. Um, when you think about um, other uh, elements uh, of sensory signals um, that could be represented in a neural feedback environment, um, it's entirely possible that you could use interoceptive signals to provide a, an individual with feedback about those, um, depending on the um, brain region uh, or the network process um, that you're targeting. Um, but even if you decide uh, that that's uh, not in your area of interest, um, one thing that I think is important to keep in mind is as individuals are doing a traditional uh, neurofeedback training, there's also this closed loop um, in process. Um, and the extent to which interoceptive processing may facilitate or inhibit neurofeedback um, for other uh, uh, extraceptive or other cognitive uh, and emotional processes, I think remains um, a, an, un, an important an understudied area. Okay, so we're gonna switch uh, to a, a new, uh, uh, slightly different topic. So one thing uh, I would like you to, to do is just to um, consider uh, uh, how well can you feel your heartbeat right now uh, without taking your pulse, um, sort of sit here for a moment and come up with a, an answer, um, a decision uh, or even an action, if you will. Can you feel your heartbeat, yes or no? If I were in the audience, if I were in the room with you, I would get a show of hands. Um, but uh, uh, basically, when you look at the literature that has um, focused on uh, uh, the accuracy of perception of heartbeat sensations, it turns out that across studies, really uh, only about a third uh, of individuals are able to perceive their heartbeat uh, under resting conditions, such as um, those of us in the audience just sort of sitting here. Um, this is true even uh, uh, if you look at long-term meditators. And here's a paper uh, over 10 years old now um, conducted with Antoine Lutz and Richie Davidson, uh, where we did not find uh, increased um, uh, heartbeat perception accuracy in meditators, long-term meditators that we thought. Um, the other interesting thing is uh, if you put somebody else's heart in your body, so heart transplant patients, 
also have about the same level of uh, resting uh, heartbeat perception accuracy. Um, so uh, those of you who really have a strong uh, and confident feeling that you can feel your heartbeat might be scratching your heads. And um, certainly we didn't take a poll of the audience, but um, it, oftentimes the, the audience response rate is, is you know, more than 50% of people feel like they can feel their heartbeat. Um, and I would argue on the basis of these studies that if I were to test everybody in the audience, um, this would be the number that we would uh, uh, obtain. So um, that's kind of, that discrepancy is a little bit hard to square. Um, but if you think about um, conditions under which um, you have con confidently and prominently felt the heartbeat sensations, you might note that um, that's during times of homeostatic uh, perturbation, uh, maybe during states of exercise, um, heightened arousal, uh, anxiety, sexual activity, et cetera. So one argument, um, again, for understanding interoception is that you can't simply rely on measuring it under a homeostatic baseline state. You really need to in include perturbations. Okay, so in terms of uh, understanding interoception, if uh, uh, this is the proverbial iceberg uh, of interoception, um, uh, much of the uh, processing happens in an unconscious way. Um, Whereas uh, when you look in the literature, you'll see something called interoceptive awareness referenced quite a bit, um, which you could think of as the tip of the iceberg. Um, what we uh, did in the previous meeting um, that I mentioned, the interoception summit, is we uh, took the features of interoceptive awareness and we tried to, in a consensus manner, um, define what do we mean by each of these terms? Um, what does it mean when you attend um, to body sensations versus you actually um, experience uh, a detection or a change? Um, uh, how do you encode the magnitude uh, or the perceived intensity of that? How do you localize it um, to a specific sensory channel? My, this is my heart beating, it's not my stomach growling, or uh, I feel this sensation in a particular area of my body, uh, et cetera. Um, one thing that I think is important for patients um, in clinically relevant contexts is this notion of insight. In other words, um, how well does your sense uh, of, of uh, how well you were perceiving your, your body relate to uh, objective reality. Um, and so uh, this framework, I think, has become useful for not only um, understanding interoception, but pursuing uh, in, in a research context. So this is an example. If you take the features of interoception and you apply it to the channel of uh, heartbeat uh, and heartbeat perception, you can see that in the literature, there have been a number of different tasks. So I might ask you to simply attend to your heartbeat, uh, or I might ask you to um, count the number of heartbeats that you feel in a given time, or press a button every time you feel a heartbeat. Uh, I could compare your um, uh, heartbeat signal to a tone and ask you to sort of uh, uh, do a signal detection paradigm. Or finally, I could do a use a perturbation. Um, and what I would argue is that uh, perturbation methods um, are probably the most useful if you're interested in studying interoception because they reliably engage all of these different features, particularly this um, element of intensity uh, or change in the magnitude of, of the signal uh, to be perceived. Um, but of course, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, there are many signals um, beyond the heartbeat signal that are interoceptive. So um, you can imagine that there are a variety of different tasks that could be developed uh, across uh, the different interoceptive sensory channels. Um, and some uh, exist in the, in, the, in the literature already. There are GI perturbation methods. Um, there are respiratory perturbation methods. But there's more work to be done there. Um, the other thing that I would like to emphasize um, is this image that you've seen before. So um, the signals of, of interoception themselves uh, are quite variable, both in terms of amplitude uh, as well as their frequency. Uh, oftentimes you have uh, amplitude and frequency modulations. Um, and the time scales can be quite dramatically different. When you think about the heart rate, which uh, normal heart rate ranges between 20 and 100, be uh, sorry, 60 and 100 beats a minute, versus the normal respiratory rate is around 12 breaths a minute, um, whereas your uh, stomach is contracting at a rate of about three times per minute. So, um, Despite all of this variability, your nervous system is constantly receiving these signals and your central nervous system uh, is integrating it um, into uh, conscious and unconscious um, uh, perception, uh, action, and behavior. Uh, 
I won't spend too much time on this, um, but uh, because uh, Maxwell spent a, a great amount of time uh, uh, probably explaining it more eloquently than I could, um, I would point you to this paper by uh, Frederica Pechner and uh, Klaus Stefan, which um, relates to um, uh, computational modeling of interoception. This is an example uh, of an inference control loop um, that is cast as a hierarchical Bayesian model. Um, and here, the key premise is that the brain represents and updates uh, generative models. So it uh, uh, sort of a model of the body um, in the world that has these hierarchically structured beliefs um, that, in, that include metacognition, elements of forecasting that inform uh, prior uh, experience um, and uh, prior expectations um, that generate lead to generations of, of uh, predictions um, about what uh, uh, can or should or is happening um, within the body. Um, and that these uh, predictions uh, are associated with uh, prediction errors, which then update um, this model. So you can see um, you have this inference control loop. Um, and of course, your actions themselves then can influence sensations. And so you have a, a number of different ways um, in which uh, the representation of interoceptive signals um, changes and changes quite dynamically over time. Um, the other factor is that interoception, of course, is but one um, general process of uh, general category of sensory processing. Um, you, of course, have the canonical extraoceptive senses as well. Um, and ultimately, um, we, we don't necessarily have a, um, a subjective experience of interoception and extraoception as being distinct, right? We just, we experience um, what we experience. And um, at certain times, uh, some signals uh, seem more salient than others, but it's not that um, there's a, sort of a, a, a turning off or a switch um, where these, um, this information is, is uh, not relevant. Uh, of course, one exception um, might be sleep, uh, but even in sleep, um, there are substantial changes in physiology that happen, um, both in terms of heart rate change, blood pressure changes, muscle tone change. And of course, uh, uh, there's dreams and, and a whole variety of subjective phenomenon that are, are far beyond uh, my talk today. Okay, so uh, with this uh, background in mind, uh, what I'd like to do is uh, switch to looking at uh, interoceptive uh, dysfunction in psychiatric disorders. And so uh, I think that uh, psychiatric disorders represent one area in which dysfunction of interoception is being increasingly recognized. Um, these are uh, common symptoms um, and signs that uh, I've actually pulled directly out of uh, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the DSM. Um, and so um, this approach, uh, uh, you can see that uh, sort of there are um, quite a number of uh, interoceptive symptoms associated with panic disorder, uh, depression, eating disorders, somatic symptom disorders, substance use disorders, uh, PTSD, GAD, um, and on down the line. Um, one, and one thing that I would like to point out is that, first of all, there's a lot of overlap um, uh, in, in some of these symptoms across disorders. Um, but the other thing uh, that I'd like to note is that um, although this description is consistent with current clinical practice, this is really only at a symptomatic level. Um, this doesn't provide any information about underlying mechanisms or causes of these disorders. Um, and so by linking brain and body, uh, I would argue that interoception may provide one component process for arriving at a better understanding of certain mechanisms and causes underlying disturbed mental health. Um, and what I'm gonna do uh, next is I'm going to present uh, some research uh, from our group uh, that illustrates this. So one uh, way that um, I've approached uh, the study of interoception is using a, what I call a visceral psychophysics approach. So you may be very familiar with the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis and, uh, and how the way that the brain uh, uh, induces the release of stress hormones uh, like cortisol uh, and epinephrine and norepinephrine. Oftentimes people, when they say they're a stress researcher, they focus just on cortisol, but it's important that uh, epinephrine or adrenaline um, is often released um, and, and re released over quite rapid timescales. The challenge is that we don't really know how these um, uh, particular hormones um, influence brain function. And so one way that we've uh, uh, adopted the study of interoception in our lab is to um, induce uh, peripheral stress responses using a drug called isoproteranol. Uh, 
um, which as you can see from the molecular structure is almost identical to uh, adrenaline. Um, the one advantage is that this um, does not uh, cross the blood-brain barrier very readily. And so it provides a nice peripheral probe um, uh, that then allows us to measure central brain responses. Um, and in particular, isoproteranol stimulates beta adrenergic receptors um, in the heart uh, and in the lungs. So uh, I think of this as a cardiorespiratory uh, interoception probe. So what I'm going to show you is an example um, of um, heart rate responses to a bolus infusion of isoproteranol. So what you can see here is um, time on the x-axis and on the y-axis is heart rate. The normal heart rate ranges between 60 and 100. And what you can see is that at different doses, uh, bolus doses of isoproteranol, we get a very nice um, heart rate uh, response um, that's reliable. Um, and the way that we study um, uh, interoceptive awareness is we ask people to uh, rotate a dial uh, in real time to indicate kind of what they're feeling. So this is an example from one of the higher doses. Um, the purple line actually represents the dial rating, um, which is on the y-axis over here. And what you can see is that um, uh, uh, when people are receiving these infusions, um, I should mention in a randomized, uh, double-blinded fashion um, uh, with a placebo control, you get a nice perceptual response that lags slightly but mirrors very, care very closely um, the change in uh, heart rate. And what we can do is we can look at the different periods. We call this, for example, the peak period, sort of the moment where there's a major change, and we can look at sort of what happens um, as perception um, is recovering uh, back down to baseline. So, um, so this, this has been a very useful paradigm for us um, to uh, measure and operationalize um, uh, interoceptive awareness. Okay, so um, this is an example uh, across several studies um, looking at different bolus doses. You can see that we get a very nice dose response curve for the heart rate. Um, and here is an example in healthy subjects of uh, dial rating responses. And one thing to point out uh, is that uh, it's often at the higher doses where we get the most reliable uh, response. And when you look at the percentage of detection rates, um, you can see that we can take people um, from right around that 35% of uh, the reporting of detection, which mirrors uh, the heartbeat detection literature, um, all the way up to everybody um, feeling a, a, a change in their heartbeat um, at the higher doses, again, in a, in a randomized and double-blinded placebo-controlled approach. We've, we've also seen that people localize um, as the dose increases, they localize uh, the sensation to a greater extent um, to the anterior chest wall. And uh, in some earlier studies, what we looked at was um, whether there was um, abnormal uh, interoceptive mapping in anorexia nervosa. So this is a study from about five years ago where we studied people with anorexia nervosa um, who uh, frequently report um, uncomfortable um, interoceptive sensations, um, gastric fullness, et cetera. Um, we didn't have a probe for gastric interoception, so we used the isoproteranol. Um, and what you can see is that when we gave them the probe um, in a pre-meal period, um, their dose response curves were uh, the same as the healthy individuals. The only difference was that during the placebo uh, infusions, uh, they really uh, tended to have an exaggerated um, detection rate. Um, and after the, they had eaten a meal, uh, which is somewhat anxiety provoking, um, they were no longer showing this exaggerated detection. Um, we thought this was, uh, was quite interesting um, and evident in, of, of a form of false perceptual experience. When we looked at their, um, their uh, localized sensations, we even found that um, the uh, AN individuals um, not only sort of reported a, a feeling of their heartbeat, but, um, but actually had uh, quite a substantial um, uh, mapping uh, or false mapping they localized um, heartbeat sensations um, to the area of the heart. But again, this was during the saline infusion when they hadn't even received any modulation with isoproteranol. Um, uh, so uh, so this, this we thought was quite interesting and we've been following up on it with a series of experiments. The other thing that we found, uh, and we've, we've sort of characterized this as, as a form of uh, visceral illusions, um, but the other thing that we found is that their magnitude estimations were also heightened during the pre-meal time period. So it's not just a, a, a phenomenon of, of sort of, uh, of, of um, feeling something when nothing is there. It also, there also seems to be this sort of um, heightened magnification response uh, 
um, even after you control for um, intensity ratings um, uh, during the saline infusions. So we've been trying to look at the neural basis um, of this interoceptive probe. Um, and in a uh, paper from a couple of years ago, um, when we uh, looked at, this uh, was an arterial spin labeling study, when we looked at brain activity, um, during that peak response window relative to baseline, um, we confirmed our prediction that we would see um, ac activation of the insular cortex. Um, in this particular case, we, we found actually very focal activation that was lateralized to the right. Um, but interestingly, when we looked at the recovery period, sort of as the brain <clears throat> was coming back down to a, a, a baseline homeostatic state, we saw an enhanced um, uh, and, and sort of expanded um, activation to other sectors of the insula, um, both the posterior uh, as well as uh, the homologous region on the left, uh, mid-dorsal insula. Um, and I won't go into too much detail on that here, but, um, but there are some uh, theoretical reasons why this could be relevant um, for um, interceptive predictions uh, and prediction error. Um, although this experiment really is not uh, the best uh, situated um, to study that uh, from a computational perspective because we only had uh, a few trials with which uh, to investigate experience. Um, I should also mention that this is actually a replication um, of an earlier um, 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 bold uh, ASL study. Um, so we're rather confident um, that uh, this um, uh, paradigm targets um, insular function. Um, <clears throat> uh, we're, we're, uh, I'm not going to show it today, but um, we are in the process of looking at um, uh, brain activity in individuals with generalized anxiety disorder, uh, as well as anorexia nervosa, to see um, what sort of neural uh, differences um, in interoception there are. So I'm going to switch gears um, and talk to you about um, uh, <clears throat> some studies that have uh, followed from a, 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 an ongoing study called the Tulsa 1000, which is a large a uh, relatively large um, study of 1,000 individuals with psychiatric disorders. It's a longitudinal study um, where we are really um, trying to phenotype patients um, across multiple units of analysis. Um, this uh, was the brainchild of Martin Paulus, our scientific uh, director of, of LIBOR. Um, and what you can see is that um, we are measuring sort of biomarkers, imaging behavior, um, and then following people on a quarterly and then annual basis. Um, and uh, we've completed the data collection um, right now, we're analyzing data from the first 500 cohort, um, but we expect that, um, and that's sort of kind of an exploratory um, hypothesis generating um, data set. Um, and then we're going to treat the second 500 as a confirmatory sample. Um, so once we find um, results that we think are, are interesting, we'll test for confirmation in that group. Um, so, um, so here is a study uh, where we found that individuals with stimulant use disorders um, actually reported uh, amplified uh, heartbeat sensations um, at rest. Um, uh, but when we had them um, do a interceptive attention task in the scanner, they actually uh, exhibited um, attenuated insula activity. Um, uh, and um, the amplified heart ratings uh, were linked to drug use recency, whereas the insula attenuation was, re was related uh, to the number of uh, past year stimulant uses. So um, these results provide evidence of an abnormal neural processing uh, of cardiac interceptive signals in drug addiction. Um, and I think uh, it could uh, be relevant um, if this ended up having a prognostic ability um, to predict relapse. Here's a study that we recently published um, looking at uh, affective responses to a respiratory perturbation. So one of the um, uh, tasks in the Tulsa 1000 is a inspiratory breath hold task. Um, you can do it right now if you would like. You just take a deep breath and hold it. You can see some um, nice heart rate uh, fluctuations and skin conductance changes. We didn't see any uh, group differences in physiological response um, across a group of 51 uh, mood anxiety disorder and 51 eating disorder subjects. But we did see heightened uh, reports of uh, suffocation feeling. Um, and actually, the suffocation feelings were even uh, uh, greater in the eating disorder group relative to the mood and anxiety group. Um, we found correlations only in the eating disorder group uh, in relation to uh, suffocation fear uh, and the anxiety sensitivity index, um, which is, uh, is a scale that measures sort of um, self-perceived uh, sensitivity to anxiety-inducing situations. So these findings um, provide uh, some evidence that abnormal respiratory interoception may be a common uh, 
uh, but potentially overlooked clinical feature of eating disorders. Okay, so for this next study, uh, it, it's clear that uh, we are uh, in the midst of a major pandemic. Uh, we know, uh, at least uh, we, we know that a lot of the things that um, are happening in terms of um, derailed education, increased domestic violence, uh, decreased public health services, we sort of um, intuitively think that this is going to lead to higher suicide rates. Um, suicide rates in the US have been increasing over the past decade already. Um, here's a paper that has predicted uh, uh, a possible increase of uh, 2,000 suicides um, in Canada. Of course, um, it, the pandemic is still too early to know from an epidemiological level whether these things are happening. But clearly, suicide is a big problem. Um, and uh, we don't have, uh, those of you who are clinicians will know that we don't have any good predictors um, of suicide. Um, we also don't really know pathophysiologically what, uh, what are some of the drivers of suicide. Um, what, what differentiates somebody who um, decides to take action to end their life um, versus um, uh, maybe having ideation uh, but not actually uh, attempting. So in a recent study, um, we uh, looked at the role of interoception um, in suicide attempters. Again, people who had um, confirmed um, a, an act to attempt their life, uh, but they had survived. Um, relative to psychiatrically matched non-attempters. Um, so when we had them do this breath hold task, uh, interestingly, um, we found that the, the attempters actually held their breaths longer, um, 12 seconds on average, and had greater increases in CO2 levels than, non, uh, than psychiatrically matched non-attempters. And if you, if you think about sort of some of the suicide attempt methodologies like hanging, um, you know, you wonder um, whether there are uh, people who have attempted uh, but have quit. Uh, early um, uh, because of uh, an inability to tolerate sort of the asphyxia uh, and the hypercapnia. Um, uh, uh, the other thing uh, that we found uh, is that um, uh, suicide attempters, um, uh, after they had reached their peak pain level on a cold presser task, um, so they had normal onset of pain ratings, but once they hit the maximum pain, um, the suicide attempters kept their hand immersed in ice water for 20 seconds longer on average and felt less stress and less difficulty doing the task. So again, if you think about this sort of action of suicide, um, uh, one wonders whether a nociceptive uh, disturbance uh, in these individuals might make it easier to make an attempt. We also saw a lower um, cardiac perception accuracy um, and an associated blunting of uh, insula activation when attending to um, heartbeat sensations. So I, I would argue that these findings um, suggest that suicide attempters exhibit um, an interoceptive numbing um, that's characterized by an increased tolerance uh, for aversive sensations and a decreased awareness uh, for non-aversive uh, non sensations. Okay, so uh, you, you're probably uh, feeling inundated at this point uh, by the slides um, and certainly by uh, uh, rapt attention uh, during this uh, uh, series of presentations. And you may wanna get away, um, in, in fact, Despite all of uh, uh, these uh, hopefully engaging comments, um, you may be feeling that way anyways in the midst of the pandemic, or you may have been feeling that way even uh, before the onset of the pandemic, just given how much um, technological uh, uh, information is um, coming at us from uh, various uh, information sources. So um, what I'm gonna present next um, is some uh, clinically relevant studies um, uh, linking to the third objective um, which is designing uh, novel neuroscience-based therapies. And what I'm gonna talk to you about in the last few minutes of my talk is something called uh, flotation uh, rest or reduced environmental stimulation therapy. Um, so uh, this is uh, a, a, a the, the older term for it um, is uh, sensory deprivation. You may have heard of sensory deprivation tanks. Uh, so this is not a new intervention per se, um, and in fact, um, this has been around um, since the 50s. Um, this is uh, an example of the early, one of the earliest uh, sensory deprivation tanks um, where you have a participant um, uh, floating uh, in some water um, in an environment that is um, uh, soundproofed and lightproofed. Um, some of these studies were actually conducted um, uh, during the space race when we were, uh, humankind was trying to put the first man on the moon and, and in the US. Um, they wanted to simulate uh, as closely as possible what it would feel like to be in an outer space environment where there's no sound and minimal gravity. And so that was the original uh, 
concept here. Um, <clears throat> and what happened was um, a lot of people, when they went in the environment, um, when they came out, noticed that they sort of had experienced a state of, of relaxation and, and reduced stress. Um, and what this led to eventually is a commercial um, development. Uh, this is the first commercial float tank. Um, you can see that the design uh, has uh, changed over the years. Um, uh, if, uh, uh, this is sort of um, intended uh, to provide a very sort of um, uh, regulated environment, which I'll go into in a little bit more detail. Um, but what you can see is that in the US and, and elsewhere, um, uh, the number of uh, centers providing uh, flotation um, as, a, as a therapy have really increased in the last 10 years. Um, and you can see that most people, um, when they um, uh, do a float, um, pay for about a 60 to 90 minute um, session, kind of similar to what you would experience if you went to a massage therapy uh, clinic. Um, so one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Justin Feinstein, got very interested in um, seeing whether this form of uh, uh, intervention could be useful um, for anxiety reduction. But if you uh, are claustrophobic at all, this is probably giving you uh, a, a bit of, uh, of discomfort um, uh, as it did to him. And so what he decided to do uh, was to design uh, an open uh, uh, float pool. So um, this is the pool uh, or open float pool at Liber. Um, this is uh, a couple of unique features. It's a round pool instead of uh, sort of a rectangular pool. Uh, it's much larger than your typical float pool. Um, and importantly, there's no enclosure. Um, and so uh, uh, the reason for the enclosure is to increase the humidity um, and to calibrate the temperature. Um, there's about 11 inches of water in this pool. And, and the reason we call it flotation is because there's about 2,000 pounds of Epsom salt or uh, magnesium sulfate, uh, bath salts. Um, and so you can see this um, person uh, is lying in the, in the water, um, but they aren't treading water. They're not holding their breath. Um, they're just floating effortlessly because the water does all the work. Um, in this case, we engineered the room so that um, it provides greater heating and um, humidity, uh, in which case the sort of the room is the enclosure. Uh, and this was our first paper just sort of examining the initial short-term anxiolytic uh, and antidepressant effects um, in individuals with uh, anxiety disorders. Um, from a uh, neuroscience perspective, um, we kind of think about it this way. Um, if this is your brain, um, when you go in a float, uh, pool, um, the lights are off. So your visual cortex isn't really getting much information. You're not moving. So there's uh, not a manipulation of proprioceptive signal. It's soundproof. So you don't hear anything unless you generate a sound. Um, there's nobody touching you. You're not touching anything. You're floating uh, in freely. Um, you're not moving and you're not talking to anybody. So the idea is that you are really attenuating um, the input to a, a large swath uh, of your uh, subcortical and cortical brain regions. Um, and what this leaves, of course, is a lot of prefrontal areas, but also we think that um, uh, there's a lot of uh, interoceptive stimulation um, that could occur. Um, and we uh, found evidence for that in our uh, second study. So this was in uh, a group of individuals with uh, uh, different anxiety disorders, a sort of a transdiagnostic sample. Um, what we found is that the um, uh, relative to a uh, film control, uh, we found that patients reported increased perception. So this is the magnitude or the intensity of their breath uh, and their heartbeat sensations, uh, but not of their stomach sensations. Um, we also uh, found that they localized uh, a greater amount of um, cardiac sensations during their float experience um, than they did during the film experience. Um, and if you're a clinician and you treat uh, uh, anxious individuals, you'll know that um, increasing breathing and heartbeat sensations is, is probably not uh, uh, a good thing, or at least it's, it's likely to be somewhat anxiety provoking. But to our surprise, uh, what we found is substantial um, short-term reductions um, in uh, state anxiety, ratings of muscle tension, um, and increases uh, in ratings of relaxation and serenity. Um, and these are uh, significantly uh, increased relative to um, this uh, very uh, uh, non-invasive um, uh, 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 sort of calming uh, film. Uh, it was the Earth series, the BBC Earth series, uh, with all of the violent uh, images kind of taken out. Uh, we also found uh, substantial reductions in blood pressure, 
Um, and so uh, we have uh, an ongoing study where we're looking at um, potential safety uh, and tolerability of this as a treatment for anxious individuals. For my last um, set of slides, uh, we just published uh, this paper um, where we've now uh, extended uh, our clinical uh, uh, trial uh, investigation approach um, to individuals with um, anorexia nervosa. Um, so this was a safety study um, where we looked at the effect of, uh, it was a single group open label pre post study design where we were just looking at whether individuals with anorexia nervosa could tolerate um, being in this environment. Um, for one thing, uh, oftentimes people float when they're um, naked um, and individuals with AN have a lot of uh, body image concerns. Um, the other thing that's important is that um, when you are floating, you're lying down. Um, and when you stand up, you're, uh, you, you have the potential for um, blood pressure changes, um, something called orthostatic hypotension. Um, this can happen when you're severely dehydrated or malnourished. Um, and it's a particular concern for individuals with anorexia. It could risk head injury, broken bones, et cetera. So really in this study, we were just testing um, whether it was uh, safe and tolerable as our primary outcome. Um, and so uh, this uh, just shows our primary outcomes data for uh, systolic and diastolic blood pressure. Um, basically, these are individual subjects during the, the different sessions where we actually measured um, their blood pressure um, in the pool when they stood up um, uh, in relation to when they, um, uh, before they got in. And what you're looking for is any dot that is below this um, red line, and you can see that there are none. Um, we also explored some secondary outcomes um, uh, because we thought this could be um, uh, helpful for um, anxiety reduction and potentially body image. So this is just showing the pre-post um, uh, uh, changes in state uh, trait anxiety inventory with the associated effect sizes, which you can see are quite large. Um, and to our surprise, we found um, also uh, a um, uh, effect size um, uh, in the form of a uh, improvement uh, in body image dissatisfaction. Um, uh, so this was uh, on a visual scale called the photographic figure rating scale. People pick basically um, outlines of bodies that reflect uh, uh, the different shape of the body they perceive. So if this is a, was a subject, the typical AN will, um, even if this is their body type, they'll report um, that their body looks like this, but they really want to have this type of body over here. Um, and the general um, uh, effect looked something like this. So if this was their pre-float ratings, this was their post-float ratings. So you can see kind of uh, more of a normalization of um, the way they perceive their current body as well as the ideal body. So we're in the middle of a um, clinical efficacy study of floating where we've randomized people to usual care versus usual care and floating. This is now with inpatients with anorexia nervosa, whereas the other study was with outpatients. Um, and at this point, uh, we are almost done with data collection. Um, so we'll, we should be finishing that up within the year um, and analyzing the data um, and we'll have that to report. Okay, so uh, after that uh, uh, tour, uh, I would return to this question um, uh, to ask you to introspect um, and ask yourself, how well do you now understand uh, the concept of interoception? Um, with that, uh, I would like to, uh, I'll skip the conclusion. Uh, I will say that um, there's some resources for studying interoception. Here's a, a wonderful book. Um, uh, this is a, um, a conference that the NIH put on uh, last year. Um, they had a recent uh, um, uh, grant uh, proposal application for that. Um, and if you're interested in reading more, um, check out the interoception library on open science um, for a comprehensive bibliography. Um, and so again, I'd like to thank the next organizers uh, and uh, would be happy to take any questions.